Okay, testing, 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 testing. What are we talking about? Predictions, predictions, predictions. So let's talk Rolex. Or rather, uh, <laughs> let's not. <laughs> Another hideous, bejeweled monstrosity to, uh, to offend the senses. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm gonna cut that bit out. <laughs> JLC, uh, Grand Seiko, um, VP, VP? No, that doesn't exist. <laughs> What was VP? Doesn't even exist. Porco miseria. Dai, facciamo tutto in italiano, no? <laughs> Never a dull moment, yeah? Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. Now, before I uh, get into my predictions, hopes, dreams for the watch industry, uh, for this year and the next year, in fact, I'll do a quick recap. And before I do that, I'll do a wristwatch check. Yeah, the Panerai is back on the wrist. I had a brief dalliance with my uh, Seamaster, but then the strap arrived, the waffle. I think it's FKL or FK, FMK. I can't remember the type of rubber they use, but it's very temperature resistant, so sporty, super comfortable. This is the 22 millimeter, the waffle from Wrist Candy Watch Club. Couldn't be happier. So I've definitely turned into a, a, a panerista. I, panerista is plural. What is a singular? What is one person? What, what is one panerista? Guys, my, my Italian gentry, please, uh, aiuta me. Predicting watches is very different compared to the faster moving world of fashion. With watches sometimes taking several years to produce from start to finish for the more complicated stuff, the minimum for more agile brands is like the gestation of a baby at nine months. So the trends we see today are actually the result of the shifting watch markets, desires and tastes of more than a year ago. So in the last few years, we have seen a never-ending plethora of green-themed watches. It's become the new blue in many ways, and with hardly any brand not doing their own spin on it. More recently, we have seen the return of ultra-deep capable divers being very much in vogue again, as was titanium and types of carbon as being the trendy choice of material. And perhaps the most short-lived of all trends, the Tiffany blue dial craze. By the auctioning off of an ultra-rare watch, featuring the most Marmite effect-inducing of all colour choices. It's safe to assume that future auctions of extremely obscure watches will also trigger further unexpected trends as a result. The vintage inspired, in giant quote marks, is a trend that is going strong despite the talk of it getting a little bit played out now. However, more recently we have seen a definite shift from less 1950s and 1960s style based designs to more those from the 1970s and 1980s aesthetics. Proof of this is the desire for integrated bracelets, the penchant for two-tone, overall sporty yet dressy styles, and many nostalgia based pop culture collaborations. Insert the Super Mario theme here. So with all that in mind, what are we going to see in the next couple of years? Uh, well, do share your suggestions, predictions, desires, and all that good stuff in the comments below. Oh, and don't forget to like this video. Very important indeed. Best way to support the channel, especially if you want to see more free and independent content like this. If green is the new blue, what is the new green? Maybe red, maybe orange, who knows? But what we do know is the amount of quartz watches the Swiss are producing continues to be in rapid decline, unlike Chinese production. And at this rate, if it continues like such, production of Swiss quartz watches will cease entirely within a decade. But it's not over for the high-end stuff. I have always adored how it was utilized in the Breitling Aerospace, for example. I'd love to see more inventive, fun, and functional uses of quartz technology in more watches. The Cartier Solar Tank being one of the best recently. They should put that in the dictionary under the definition of no-brainer for its utter genius. So with all that in mind, I don't doubt for a second the frightfully clever chaps at Amiga and Swatch when they're not swimming in their ducktails amounts of money. <laughs> uh, they're already coming up with something 
uh, similar to the moon swatch. Uh, I predict, well, I'd like to see actually a kind of plastic affordable version of the Bond watch, a Seamaster swatch kind of thing. Maybe, what do you guys think? Christopher Ward's exciting democratization of a super high-end complication with the chiming bel canto watch is certainly not something to be ignored. While the subsequent cash grab with suddenly releasing several color variations immediately afterwards did somewhat cheapen the proceedings. But let's be honest, this is still a game changer and without a shadow of a doubt, we'll have many other brands looking to make similar, more daring and experimental moves. The Bel Canto was important for two fundamental reasons, a much needed kick up the backside for British brands that have for the most part been rather stuffy and overly conservative, no matter how fancy or refined they may be. And secondly, more importantly, you don't need cavernously deep pockets to acquire something now a bit more fun, unique, different, and with a much needed sense of pizzazz without being flashy or just gaudy. Suddenly feeling quite nauseous, but I'm, uh, yeah, I'm looking at you, Richard Miller. <laughs> so compelling was the Christopher Ward that for the first time in about a decade, almost a decade, I considered buying uh, one myself. Had it not been Christmas and the looming, uh, you know, financial uh, <laughs> burden of that season, I probably would have pulled the trigger. 2023 and 2024 will be the era of the micro brand GMT. With the Citizen Empire releasing the Miyota 9075 caliber, there is no doubt that we will start to see a ton of inventive and interesting utilizations of this affordable and true GMT movement. The fact it was debuted on this very channel you're watching now before anywhere else online in a video speaks volumes about how forward thinking and open minded brands like Bulova are. And if you didn't know, Citizen actually owns Bulova. And speaking of which, I think the next few years we will see the Citizen group really create some exciting stuff. It is the height of design and technology. Accutron is not a timepiece. It's a conversation piece. Last year, we explored Accutron and their pioneering electrostatic technology, along with their wonderfully fun and stylish legacy collection. With such a rich heritage of design, cultural icons, and groundbreaking horological technology to pull from, this brand has so many possibilities. As I've said before, Accutron very much are going to be the new Grand Seiko. With Seiko moving up scale with their prospects and their pricing, it leaves a kind of gap in the market and we're seeing a resurgence or a return of automatic divers from Citizen, which is just fantastic because they got such a rich legacy to pull from themselves as well. You know, the Marina Militare connection, very beloved in Italy by professional and saturation divers. A design language all of their own, I think especially with the NY0090, if you guys remember that really cool watch. Very 90s, but still cool. And let's not forget EcoDrive as well. And I've been saying for donkey's years, a superior quality to uh, Seiko at the entry level, in my opinion. Another noteworthy point about Citizen is that they also have Frédéric Constant up their sleeve too. And if you remember last year, the insanely cool monolithic escapement. With so much proprietary high-end watchmaking capabilities in their arsenal, it's almost limitless what interesting and cool things they could come up with. I wouldn't be surprised and also personally hopeful that they go down the Christopher Ward bel canto direction. So let's talk Rolex, shall we? Or rather, let's not. I couldn't think of anything more boring uh, than that particular brand. I, I've said this before, I'm done with Rolex myself. Having said that, I wouldn't say no to some of their vintage watches. Root beer, oof, yeah, two-tone. Oh, there's something about it on a Jubilee. I think it's the Clint Eastwood uh, movies that does it for me. But anyway, having said that, I wouldn't mind seeing a Polar Explorer, you know, white dial. And of course, we cannot ignore, it's the 60th anniversary of the Daytona. So there's definitely gonna be something big in that department. That'll be interesting, I guess. But generally, yeah, don't really care. <laughs> However, Tudor is another matter entirely. With the Black Bay collection being so oversaturated to the point it's almost comical, it's time for the other side of Tudor to shine. 
Just look at the outstanding history section of their website and you will immediately see a ton of gems they could bring back. How about that stunning tuxedo dial Oyster Prince reference 7950 from around the 1950s? You might remember I have been asking for the return of the big block chronos, like the tiger I once owned. Tudor have a remarkably distinguished and underrated history with chronographs. That's a gold mine just begging to be exploited. The Monte Carlo in particular, with its extensive racing legacy and even being the choice of Tom Cruise in a Mission Impossible movie. Take the layout and switch it to a V-shaped compact. Bung in a Canessi or Canessi, you know, those in-house movements that you have nowadays. I should know how to pronounce that. I have done a review on it. Uh, and, and bingo, what have you got? An affordable Daytona that everyone would go absolutely gaga for. You like what I did there? Yeah. A blue Pelagos 39mm is kind of a given at this point. But this is a fitting segue into talking about watch sizes in general. The smaller watch trend is still going very strong, and I sense it will culminate in the ultimate manifestation of this scale, the super thin, minimal, mid-century dress watch. The biggest indicator of this is surprisingly an actor that's having somewhat of a revival in recent years with the John Wick franchise. We are indeed talking about the ineffable Keanu Reeves. When do you become a collector? When you have more than two or more than one or more than three? At the end of 2021, something really interesting happened. In a late winter publication of Esquire magazine, the beloved actor was being interviewed while promoting his recent movies. In the photo shoot, along with his signature all black attire, he was wearing a very discreet and modestly sized dress watch, the Patek Philippe Ellipse, no less. This watch is no stranger to the channel. It was featured in the video about the watches of the top James Bond villains. Launched in 1968, its distinctive, elegantly soft oval curved shape was inspired by Fibonacci's famous golden ratio that gives it its name. So what's the deal with Keanu Reeves? Uh, I'm not the biggest Keanu Reeves fan, actually. I just saw Devil's Advocate um, recently again. His performance was yeah, so underrated. Forget Dracula and that dodgy English accent, oh dear. He's amazing. And um, it's not really what he's wearing. Well, it is. It's, it's more to do with how he's wearing it. A simple mechanical two-handed time-only dress watch is the antithesis of the ultra-complicated Apple smartwatch. In many ways, it's a rejection of the generic disposable wrist-top phone and watch industry's current main threat. We all know a well-maintained watch can last for generations, far beyond the finite years of the so-called smart watch. Slenderness in a timepiece is also an expression of traditional mechanical watchmaking prowess, a competition and rivalry that still carries on today among horse horology brands. And a shout out to my good friend John for putting me onto this observation. Keanu, who is also into motorbikes, has been seen wearing this watch with his leather racing jacket. A direct inverse of the sports or tool watch mixed with smarter attire that we see in the Bondian fashion. This, like 007, is also a rebellious flex of sprezzatura that displays a level of connoisseurship by choosing such a refined, unassuming, but instantly recognizable high-end icon to those in the know. Once again, one of my favorite microbrands, Laurier, is at the crest of this new wave with their very first dress watch late last year, the Zephyr. And this raises a great point. There are tons of affordable options to be scored, both new and used. My vintage Seiko Dolce tank I picked up for a measly 60 bucks in a recent video is a great example of a classy and timelessly classic perfect dress watch. Speaking of the tank, I predict that Cartier will continue their ascension to a kind of holy trinity level of horturology with more ingenious uh, creations. Up there with JLC and, and, and BC and PP and ALS and Grand Seiko. And speaking of all those brands, I'm sure they're gonna wow us with something. Uh, they always do. All trends are cyclical. I'm sure the oversized trend will inevitably return. Some watches, however, like my Panerai and Navitimer, are supposed to be big and oversized. 
in the same way a dress watch is supposed to be small and discreetly thin to slide under a cuff. Function dictates form, but there's also some wiggle room. 40 millimeters becoming the new 42 millimeters, 36 millimeters becoming the new 38 millimeters, etc. These changes, unlike color, will take the longest to cycle. Another trend I don't see uh, going away anytime soon, um, we all know why, the exploitation of limited editions and the FOMO and all the price gouging and all the hype and all the rest of it. Doing a collaboration once or twice a year, if you're a brand or a blog or a store or whatever you are, right, or a vlogger, like my collaborations, once or twice a year, absolutely fine. But when you do it every single month, in my opinion, it devalues the brand doing it and also whoever they collaborate with. But that's my opinion, and I don't see any of that stopping uh, this year or the next year or the year after that. How we talk about watches is also evolving. Primarily, this is why all the watch content I enjoy and consume is only ever from real watch enthusiasts and collectors, not dealers talking about what watch they are selling. Sadly, in the last few years, YouTube and Instagram in particular have been overloaded with endless nauseating chat about value, buying for investment, the price of this, the price of that, and endless flipping for profit. Hey, it's Chris Angel. I want to welcome you to my 22,000 square foot estate known as Serenity. Watches are connected to like extreme materialism in a lot of people's eyes. Like they don't totally. Like, yeah, it's one of those things totally. where people are like, oh god, you're into watches. Mm -hmm. Like you must be a dude. Totally. It's a fair argument. If you are into that kind of content, by all means, enjoy. But for me, treating watches merely as a commodity, along with the tasteless exploits of those with more money than decency or taste, well, I find it very boring, derivative, mostly uninformative, and insulting to those less well off or dealing with hard times. Sure, the value of a watch is an important aspect to consider, but not the main deciding factor. I predict, and I also hope, we return to an age driven more by the enthusiast and not the dealer. Those actually passionate more about watches rather than making money. With smartwatches killing the industry three times the speed of the quartz crisis during the 1970s, it's vital that the watch industry is driven by those who really care and love watches, not parasitic elements out for profit that will only assist in killing it faster. I have said this before, the best thing about YouTube is anyone can do it. The worst thing about it is anyone can do it. So let's end on a positive note. Ultimately, what will save the watch world will be, well, love, passion, compassion for each other, camaraderie, uh, helping others, to get into the hobby, uh, the, the learning, the information, and all of that good stuff. I really hope and I predict we see a shift back to the enthusiast. That's the wonderful thing about social media. It enables or it empowers people like me and fellow watch lovers like you guys out there. So I think it's important to really support that. Speaking of which, don't forget to like this video. Best way to support this particular video. Uh, and yeah, onwards and upwards, I'll catch you in the next one. Don't forget to uh, share your feedback. Love hearing uh, what you guys have to say. Onwards and upwards. Thank you for watching. Ciao.